What do you think of church? Healing. Um, I believe in God. I just don't believe in the church system. That's just a business trying to get some money. You know, uh, tithes and offerings is just a way to say, uh, I need your money uh, to pay my rent and to pay my car note. The church is God's bride. Well, I'm not a churchy person. Jesus said he's going to the church first. So I'd rather stay out here where he was at, walking the streets, talking to the people. The, I could, from a college perspective, I think it's all right. I hate it. I think it's a disgrace to our country. It's a horrible thing for our society, and it needs to be uh, eliminated. The way how it was put onto my people, Christianity, I can't attend no church. Spiritual. Church is an amazing thing, but they need to shut the doors. Only people belong in church on Sundays are elderly and the children. Men and healthy women need to be out here witnessing to the people, talking to them. Um, boy, religion, that's a tough question. Uh, I think there's some cool churches out there, but uh, what goes on inside them is not for me. Spiritual uplifting, I guess. It's not a place where people come to be perfect. It's a place where people come to experience the perfection of Jesus Christ. And if you're told what to think your entire life, you're nothing. So, And I think that's what religion does. They really just tell you from a young age what to believe and you think nothing of it, and then you just contribute to a bunch of churches who don't even pay the taxes, or taxes, my bad. And it's not just like a building, but it's like the people that come in and serve there and worship there. And I mean, I think you, in order to receive something, something significant from church, you have to also be investing into it. Sometimes I cry at church. Same here. A lot of times I cry at church. There you go. I okay. cried last weekend. <laughs> Did you? Same here. So I'm not sure how you're feeling after that video. You know, for me personally, like there was one side where I was like, yeah, I'm glad not everyone has any, you know, something negative to say about church. But then on the other side, it was like, ooh, some of those stink a little bit. I wonder what, you know, happened to cause them to have those views of church. Well, today, the Apostle Paul, in our study through Ephesians, he's going to be talking to the church. He's going to be talking about church. He's going to be talking about how we need to interact with the church. Um, if you've been a part of the series, I hope by now you understand that Paul's focus is really about identity. Right? When we know who we are, we know what to do. And so he focuses the first like three chapters all about identity, just constantly who you are, who you are, your true identity in Christ. If you've put your faith in Jesus, well, then you are in Christ. You're no longer in Adam. You're no longer in sin. You're no longer experiencing that, that death that sin brings. Instead, you are in that position of Jesus, receiving all the love and the mercy and the grace from the Father. That's who you are. Now, what he's going to do now is he's going to turn the corner just a little bit, and he's going to talk a little bit more about what we, what we do. Like, really, from chapter 4 all the way through chapter 6, it's really about that do. You know, one way to look at it is, Chapters 1 through 3, it's a, it's a, it's a message about identity. Um, if this is true, if you're really in Christ, chapters 4, 5, and 6 say, okay, if this is true, this is what you do. And so he's going to be talking about what we do with the church, um, how we interact with it, what we do with the church. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Ephesians chapter 4. We're going to start reading in verse 1. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, what do we do with this thing called the church? All right, verse 1 says, As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. So, again, right from the beginning, you can tell he's kind of making this, this turn. He's saying, okay, this, this is who you are. You're in Christ. Now, here's how you need to live your life. If this is your identity, this is how you need to live out that identity. One way to, to look at this would be, you know, when you were... A student, you had a specific identity. Some of you are still students, and you have to kind of live and walk uh, in a certain way because of your identity as a student. Like, you enter your classroom, and the mindset is, okay, I need to be teachable and hopefully respectful of your teachers, right? That's who you are. That's what you're supposed to do. But have you ever been on the other side of that? Have you ever been the teacher? Have you ever been the communicator? Like, you enter the classroom a little different. Like, you don't sit down with your notepad and say, okay, kids, now you lecture me, you, you share with me all your wisdom. No, that's not your identity. Your identity is you're a teacher, so you're supposed to be the one who's teaching. Same with parents. You know, when you were a kid, like, you had to listen to mom and dad. That was your posture. I need to be respectful. I need to obey them. But now as parents, well, you're the one guiding. You're the one leading. You're the one directing. That's your identity. Paul says, you've been called. You've been called to be in this relationship with God 
through Christ. You are in Christ. Well, so how do you live your life now? He goes into some specifics in verse 2. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. I just want to look at this verse real quick before we move on to more specifics about the church. But what would it look like if the church in general just became a lot more humble? If we just entered the public sectors with this mindset that maybe maybe we don't actually have all the answers. Clearly, Scripture has given us plenty of answers, but maybe we just have this posture that we can listen to other people's stories before we tell them our story. That maybe we care a little bit more about what they're communicating, um, you know, actually listening to understand rather than just trying to make them understand us. What would happen if we had that type of humility? What would happen if we as a church became far more gentle? Like when harsh words are spoken to us or about us, we don't respond in kind. You know, what if we became patient, not demanding that people move at our pace, uh, not making them speed up or slow down, but we actually matched their pace? What if we actually looked at people's burdens and decided, let's shoulder some of that burden for them? We actually stepped in and said, okay, how can we alleviate this struggle in your life? Not because of what we can get from them, but because we just genuinely love them. I think that video would probably be a little differently, different, wouldn't it? Like some of the things that were communicated in that video, a little bit more positive, probably, if this was the constant attitude of the church. Uh, unfortunately, you know, people who have encountered Christ should probably be the most humble, gentle, loving people on the face of the earth. Why? Because that's, that's the attitude that we see in Christ. I mean, Christ lived out humility. He lived out gentleness. He lived out so much patience and love. And so this is how we should actually interact with people. But I think oftentimes the church looks a lot like the largest piece of gold that's ever been discovered. I don't know if you're aware of this, but about 70 years ago, they discovered the largest piece of gold in Bangkok, Thailand. Uh, kind of a random place to, to find gold, but uh, just to tell you the story, there was this massive um, statue of Buddha. It was a cement statue of Buddha, and uh, it had been in Bang Bangkok for uh, hundreds of years. No, no one knew exactly its origin, and it had become really weather-beaten. Um, it was one of those things that people would pass, and they wouldn't really notice anymore, and even, uh, you know, People had some, uh, were worried about even vandals, uh, to the point where they put it in, or at least they sheltered it in this little shack, and it had a tin roof, and, and the rain was even creeping on it, and you know, it was just, it was in a bad state. <clears throat> and so one of the, the Buddhist monks <clears throat> decided that they were going to go ahead and organize uh, a group of people to actually transport it into one of their temples. And so they got a crane, and they got ropes, and they got pulleys, and they started moving this thing into the temple, and tragedy hit. Uh, one of the ropes broke, pulleys got twisted, and all of a sudden, uh, Buddha is crashing down to the ground. It, hundreds of years old, hundreds of years old, so people are gasping, oh my goodness, is, is this thing okay? So they go over, and sure enough, yeah, it has this huge crack in it. But then one of the workers begins to peer a little bit closer at the crack, and when he moves his head just right, there seems to be something shiny coming through on the other end, and upon further investigation, they realize that this is actually a, a solid gold statue of Buddha. 9.8 feet tall, solid gold, weighing five, point, five and a half tons, just straight gold. And, and so, of course, historians are like, what in the world? Like, how did this happen? Why, why was it covered up with cement? And so as much as they could piece together was that at some point, hundreds of years earlier, based on the design and the art of Buddha himself, that probably what happened is either some monks were worried that an invading army would go and take this, or they were getting threats from other things going on politically. And so what they decided to do was they decided to cover it up with cement. They decided to cover up this solid gold uh, statue with cement and still leaving the um, basic outline of Buddha. Now here's the thing. I think oftentimes as a church, <clears throat> when we don't fully embrace and live out our identity in Christ, I think this is oftentimes what we're doing with Christ. Like, if we don't fully embrace our identity in Christ, he's not shining through. And maybe sometimes as a church, we've got a, at least a remnant of, of Jesus like in us. People look at the church and they say, well, you know, they're, they're not all bad, right? They're, they're teaching their children basic morals. Uh, they're, not, they're not all bad. They salute the flag. They pay their taxes. But it's just kind of this the cement covering of the greater glory that Christ really wants us 
to shine through. In fact, the question that I would like to ask today, and hopefully the Apostle Paul will give us enough information so that we can answer the question. The question that I want us to ask is, what does the church need to do? What does the church need to do in order for Christ to shine through? And what do we need to do on a consistent basis to let Christ shine through in all that we do? The Apostle Paul starts giving some answers, starting in verse 3. <clears throat> verse 3 says, Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. I, I want to I focus on that word, or at least that phrase, make every effort. So anything that Paul's going to call us to do, it's not necessarily going to come easily. Like Whatever it is that Paul is going to challenge us to do, it's actually going to require some effort, some sweat, maybe some blood and some tears. Now, what is this effort moving towards? Unity. He says, make every effort, what? To keep the unity. And let's just talk about this unity for a moment. Verse 4 explains it a little bit more. It says, there is one body and one spirit, just as you were called to one hope when you were called. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. So when you accepted Christ and you put your faith in Jesus, understand you were not supposed to do that thing, uh, supposed to do life and, and, and this relationship with God solo. Right? That was not just you and God, you experiencing this wonderful grace. You're actually supposed to be now in community. And we, we, we talk about this oneness, this unity, and I just want to First of all, point out uh, a few realities about this unity that we as a church actually have. Uh, there's a word that gets repeated over and over and over again in these few verses. Did you catch what that word is? It's the word one. It's the word one. Yeah, that, that was my, my clue. Uh, yeah, uh, you probably didn't count how many times this word actually got used, but it was seven. Seven times the word one gets used. And if you are a student of scripture, some of you are like, oh, interesting, seven. And the reason why you're saying, oh, interesting, seven, is because you know that in Scripture, the number seven actually points to completion. And so what, what are we seeing here? Well, one of the things that we're actually seeing is that our unity in Christ as the church, as this, this is a theological like, fact. Like, we are united in Christ. As a church, we are united. It may not always feel that way, but that's exactly what's happening. Let's just unpack a few of these, these statements that Paul makes here. He says, those who are in Christ, sorry, those who are in Christ make up one body. What body? Christ's body, right? He, he began this ministry, he died, he rose again, and, and now we are continuing his ministry. And so over and over again in scripture, what are we, the church, referred to as? The body of Christ. Why? Because we're continuing his ministry. And so we have to stay united on mission with him. So as one body, there is we are being empowered by one spirit, right? Again, unity. We are united around one hope, right? Again, unity. But what else does Paul say here? We have one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father. So just as Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit are one in the Trinity, guys, we are one as the church. And sometimes I think probably maybe only God can see that unity. Like when we walk into a church, someone's like, man, that guy's a little weird, and well, she sounds a little different. And we only see what divides us. You look at another church, and you're like, oh, man, I know we've got the corporate church thing going on, but gosh, they do things a little strange. And sometimes I think, honestly, only God sees the unity that's actually taking place. But this is a theological reality. As a church, we are one. On top of that, it's a, it's a hard-fought reality, right? It's one of those things that you have to constantly be working towards. I don't want to underemphasize the fact that Paul begins his word, uh, words here in verse 3, make every effort. Why does he have to say that? If you've been in church long enough, you know that there are so many things that divide us. There's so many things that can just ruffle our feathers, right? So how do we stay united as a church? I've talked to you guys about this before, but I think so much of it really comes down to making sure that we stay focused on purpose rather than just our preferences. Like, focus on our purpose, not just our preferences. I have preferences, you have preferences, I know my preferences, and I, I think I actually know all of your preferences too. You know what my preference is? My preference is that you think like me, my, my preference is that you communicate like me, my preference is that you behave like me, that you have values like me, basically that you're like me. That's my preference. 
It is, it is. And, and here's the thing, that's your preference too. Like, you want people to think like you, behave like you, speak like you, have the same value system as you. And when they don't, you know, makes you feel a little awkward and uncomfortable. And, and I get it. Some of you are like, no, John, I, I love the fact that some, you know, that we all have different opinions and, and people sharing their ideas and we're so much better because of it. Certainly, certainly. But we've all been in those moments. We've all had those times where we're talking to somebody and we thought we had great unity with them. And then they tell you who they voted for. And you're like, what? Are you, what? And you don't say anything. But in the back of your mind, you're like, you got to be kidding me. Like, I thought we were on the same page here. And then they start telling you their views and their thoughts on the vaccine. And you're like, oh my gosh, this guy's a wacko, right? And then they tell you what sports team they actually root for and cheer for. And you're like, oh, that's it, right? You thought you guys were cool with each other, but now I don't even know if I can trust this guy. Anyone ever been there, right? All of a sudden, your preferences broke down the unity. This is what happens when you focus just on your preferences. But God calls us to focus on purpose. And so what is, what is the purpose of Christ? Let's go back, you know, what was the purpose of Jesus? His purpose was to take those who were in sin, those who were dying, separated from a holy God, and bring them back into a proper relationship of peace with their creator, God. That's the purpose. And so we as the church, if you have put your faith in Jesus, that's what we keep focusing on. That's what we keep going back to. What is the purpose? What is the purpose? Okay, yeah, I don't really care for that color, but the purpose over here is actually to save souls. So I don't really care about the color of the carpet. Right? I, I know that's who you want to vote for. That's not really my preference. But here's the thing. I'm actually going to focus on Jesus. This is what we're called to do. This is how we stay united. Paul continues. <clears throat> Verse 7. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he took many captives and gave gifts to his people. What does he ascend and mean except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. Let's pause there. This is a strange section of scripture. On first reading, I didn't get it. Uh, on second reading, I, I was still scratching my head. I, I, I still don't know if I 100% understand what's going on, but I think I do. Uh, and I think it helps to understand what verse he's using. So in verse 8, uh, we read that he's taking a verse from Psalm 68. So if you've ever read Psalm 68, and I'm not going to uh, pretend that you have memorized that verse, but let's just um, go to Psalm 68 and, and know that the big idea of this psalm is that God has won some victories, and he's giving these good gifts. Like, that's the big idea. There's more to it than that. But basically, like, God has won these victories and he's giving his people these, these wonderful gifts. Um, why is he using this, though? Like, why is Paul using this? I think one of the main reasons is for this word ascended. He, he grabbed onto that because what do we know in, in Jesus? Like, he had victory when he conquered death and eventually ascended into heaven. And he received all these blessings from God, and then he gave these gifts to the church. This is pretty much the, the flow of the thought. It's kind of a strange way to kind of introduce like gifts to the church, maybe even spiritual gifts to the church, but that seems to be what Paul is trying to communicate. So what are these gifts that, that, uh, that God has given the church? Verse 11, so Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And so if we're going to let Christ's light shine through, what do we have to do? Number one, we have to stay united. Number two, we have to go on mission. Like we have to be in this unity Surrounded in the love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus, we go on mission, continuing the ministry that he began 2,000 years ago. That's what we're supposed to do. That's what God has called us to. We're supposed to be on mission. And we've got these really cool gifts that allow us to do this. What are the gifts? Did you catch it in verse 12? He's given us something. He's given us. I'll just read it again. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, the teachers. You may be sitting here and you go, yeah, but I'm not any of those things. So what is my role to play? If we're on mission, what am I supposed to do? I don't think I'm an apostle. Maybe I am. I don't know if I'm necessarily a teacher. 
he's not listing necessarily a, a whole bunch of spiritual gifts that you know 90% of you have. Most likely in the church in Ephesus, there were people who had these gifts. But the majority of the church did not. But they still brought whatever they had to the mission of Christ. Verse 7 explains it this way. But to each one of us, grace has been given as Christ appointed it. So you have been given these gifts. You've been given some gifts to actually use. Maybe your gift is actually you, you have some finances. Maybe your gift is you just encourage people. Maybe your gift, your, the grace that God has given you is simply you've got some really hard life experiences that God has allowed you to go through and you're able to use that to actually build other people up. Whatever grace God has given you, you utilize it for the benefit of the church and God's kingdom. I, uh, I was in a conference a number of years ago. I've shared this with a few of you before. But uh, in this conference, there was a pastor. His name was Bill Hybels. He's no longer um, serving as a, he's getting older these days. Um, but he was, he, was in, he was talking about this moment in his church where there was a lot of growth, and so they were hiring a ton of people. And, and some of those uh, people never really got to know Pastor Bill. It, it was one of those things that they wanted to, to make sure they had at least some contact with Bill. And so part of their onboarding process was for any new hires uh, to come into like kind of a, a small group setting and he would give the rah-rah speech and say, hey, this is what we're doing and this is your part to play. And at the end, he would open it up for Q&A, question and answer time. And at the back of the room during this question and answer time, one guy at one point raised his hand and said, hey, you know, Pastor, I, I feel kind of bad like asking people to serve in the church because they're so involved in you know, work responsibilities and school responsibilities and family responsibilities, and then I'm asking them to like now participate in church responsibility. I just feel kind of bad about that. Like, how do you get over that? And Bill said, like, the first thought that came to his mind wasn't the, the kindest thought. His thought was, who hired this guy, and how do we get him out of here, right? Like, that was his first thought, and then he kind of tempered it a little bit, and he said, you know what? I never, I never feel bad inviting people in to what God has created them to be a part of. I never feel bad about that. You know, I think one way to say that would be when you know who you are, you know what to do. And so you have to ask yourself the question, if your identity, if your identity is firmly in Christ, you're receiving all these blessings from the Father, well then what do you do? You're a part of a church community who is continuing the same ministry of Jesus. Like, that's what you do. And I think it's pretty tempting at times, you know, look at paid staff, look at Josh and be like, you know what, Josh, you're getting paid? Bro, I, I'm just going to enjoy your worship. I don't need to necessarily participate, right? I, I don't need to be up here. Like, that's your thing. Jonathan, you're the one that gets paid for it. Why don't you do it? But that's not the biblical model that we see here. I mean, what do we see in Scripture? So God has given Jesus has given these wonderful gifts of the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers. Why? Verse 12 explains. To equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ, the ministry of Jesus that began 2,000 years ago, may be continuing to be built up and God's kingdom comes. Right? That's the purpose. That's what we're trying to do here. And I don't know if we always get it right. In fact, I know we don't. But that's our goal. I don't know if you're aware of this. Um, you know, sometimes we emphasize, we emphasize what's happening here. And it's like, hey, come participate in this church experience. Or we need people to serve in this area. And it all has to do with, like, the four walls of this church. Understand what I'm talking about. And I'm talking about, like, going on mission for Jesus and being in the church and staying united and being on mission for him. I'm not just talking about what's happening here in, these, in this building. I'm also talking about being the church that actually reaches out to our community. I'm talking about the church that's actually reaching out globally with the message of Christ. You may or may not be aware of this, but in the book of Acts, the book of Acts is basically this history lesson on what the Holy Spirit was doing to, to start the early church. So it's just wonderful things about the early church. There were 40 miracles uh, that have been recorded in the book of Acts. 40. Do you know how many of them actually uh, took place in what we would consider kind of a traditional church setting, out of 40, just one miracle that happened inside the church. So if we just use that as a lens 
for where ministry should be taking place, that's a pretty small, narrow perspective. Really, 39 miracles took place when we went outside the walls of our church. Isn't that interesting? And so maybe even ask yourself the question, where have I seen God working? Where have I seen his power moving? Did it happen, did it happen in a really powerful worship service? Did it happen with some like hardcore gospel preaching? I mean, not here, maybe some other church, right? But uh, what did you last see? Like God's power at work. I think we need to make sure that, that and praise God, praise God for pastors and, and, and uh, worship leaders. I mean, praise God for powerful teaching and, and worship. But I think we need, to, we need to also be taking that ministry outside of, of these walls. Wouldn't football be the most boring sport in the entire world? I think most of you, you like football. Wouldn't it be so boring if all the game was, was, you know, the team went out to the middle of the field, they got into a huddle, quarterback calls this really great dramatic play, and he says, all right, let's do it, break. And they break from the huddle, they slap the quarterback on the back, they give him a fist pump, and they go sit back down on the bench. That would be like the worst game ever. Like, dude, you called the play, now it's time to actually deliver the play, right? And this is what we do. You know, I, I try my best to call some good plays as a quarterback, but we also need to actually be engaging the play. This is what God calls us to do. Jesus does this really well. And I don't know if we always get it right, but I think Jesus did. And so let's just kind of really quickly evaluate how did Jesus equip the disciples? How did he make disciples who made disciples? First of all, he went to everybody. He went to anybody. You know, Think about the people that were a part of his inner circle. Some were educated, some were not educated. Some were male, some were female. He had a guy named Judas who you scratch your head and you think, man, why did you have that guy in the inner circle? And then he's got like two other guys, uh, brothers by the name of the Sons of Thunder. You know, like, you know, those guys were fun to roll with. Like, I'll keep them on my crew. Uh, but what about all these other people? Like, he used everyone. And then what did he say? He said, okay, here's the thing. I have actually come to serve, not to be served, and to give my life as a ransom for many. That's, that's what I'm doing. You guys, you guys up for that? You guys want to do that with me? They say, yes. Yes, we do. And so even as we see his example, well, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to serve. We're supposed to, to give up our lives to the point where it's like, oh, I don't know if I can give anymore. Like, this is what God calls us to do. Jesus lived this out. Jesus, he trusted them. He gave them authority to actually carry out his ministry. You know, sometimes as a bit of a control freak, it's like, okay, well, should we do that ministry? I don't know. Uh, can I trust you with it, right? No, what did Jesus do? He said, yeah, you can do this. Do you think the disciples were ready for it? <laughs> with the empowerment of the Holy Spirit only, right? But that's what he did. He, he entrusted them. And then he gave very clear instructions, so clear, crystal clear. What are we supposed to do, Jesus? Go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. That's it. That's the game plan. Okay, so we know where we're supposed to go. <clears throat> Not intimidating at all. Uh, the entire world, okay? Uh, what are we supposed to do there? Um, we're supposed to make disciples how? You've only given us a little bit of how, so we're supposed to teach them? We're supposed to baptize? That's it? Jesus says, yeah, yeah. You, you'll figure out the rest. You're good to go. And that's what we've been trying to do for the last 2,000 years. Like he gave us enough, and he knew that, that strategies would change but the mission would always stay the same. Methods might have to change, and methods are going to even have to change here at our church, but the mission stays the same. We're on mission, united, saying, let's save people's souls. Let's save people's lives. Verse 14, Paul continues. <clears throat> then we will no longer, let's just back up, then. What's the then? When we're united. When we're going on mission. When we finally understood, okay, this is who we are. Our identity is in Christ. What do we need to do? We need to stay united. We need to go on mission. Then, then and only then, will you, will we no longer be infants tossed back and forth by the waves and blown here and there by every wind of teaching and by the cunning and craftiness of people in their deceitful schemes. Paul's being relatively polite here. I would love to translate what he's saying just a little bit so it's a little bit more poignant. Um, the Apostle Paul is basically saying, church, grow up. Like, that's what he's saying. He's like, church, it's time for you to grow up. 
If you understand your identity in Christ, you'll stop identifying yourself as an infant. Right? Grow up. If you are in Christ, live out that identity in Christ. Be united. Stop caring so much about preferences and stay on mission. Keep that purpose in front of you. Because what happens if you take a baby and you just toss that baby into the ocean? What's, that, what's going to happen? Well, that baby's going to float around a little bit and then finally sink under the waves, right? And if we don't wake up every single morning and say, who are we? Okay, we're in Christ. We're saved, we're loved, we're forgiven, and we're on mission, united together with the church. If we're not sold out on who we are, we're going to be just tossed around by any tragedy that ends up happening, any strange political uh, development. It's going to be like waves that just hit us and we're like, ah, what's going on today? It doesn't matter. If you're in Christ, You know you're supposed to stay united and you're supposed to go on mission for his purposes. That's what God has called us to do. Verse 15. Instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of him who is the head. That is Christ. From him, the whole body, joined and held together by every supporting ligament, grows and builds itself up in love. As each part does its work. How does he conclude this? He says, you've got a part to play. You've got a part to play. I have a part to play. We all have a part to play in this thing called the church. And what is this thing called the church? It's the body of Christ. We are in Christ. We have been forgiven. We have grace. And now we share that love and that same mercy with others. And are there times where you've got to bring up some some real truth with people? Yeah. As long as it doesn't have to do with your preferences. Speak the truth. Throw down some scripture. And how are you supposed to do that according to verse 15? In love. In love. You know, again, going back to this giant golden Buddha statue. Huge chunk of gold, right? Um, Do you know how much five and a half tons of gold is worth in today's currency? Over a quarter of a billion dollars. I mean, that's a ton of money. A quarter of a billion dollars, anyone? Like, that would, be, that would be pretty awesome, wouldn't it? And so the question on all of our minds is, how in the world did that go undiscovered for so many centuries? Well, I think it's probably very similar to how sometimes we just fail to let Christ's light shine, his glory shine through us. You know, we, we decide instead of letting God's glory shine through us, we, we cover ourselves up with cement when we focus on our preferences rather than focusing on our purpose. We cover ourselves up, God's glory and his light and his love, we cover ourselves up when we focus on the fact that, well, hey, church life, like that's, that's my spiritual you know, time. You know, the, the Sunday morning experience is where I'm going to go ahead and engage spiritually, but then the other six days out of the week, I'm going to kind of do my own thing. That's how we let the light of Christ, the glory of Christ be diminished in the church. And so the challenge, the challenge is not a new challenge. In fact, it's one that I've communicated uh, quite often here on stage, but probably even more so in our life group. The challenge is this, and if you're a part of our life group, you know this, and and I hope you're you're understanding it and you're living it because it's part of our our key discipleship model. Um, What we want you to do is we want you to identify a place. Every single person in here, if if you identify yourself as in Christ, and you're on mission for Christ, we want you to find a ministry here in the church that you can engage in and serve in on a regular basis. Like inside the walls of these churches, of our church. Whether that's tech, whether that's children, whether that's worship, whether that's prayer ministry, whatever it is. You know, you engage on a regular basis with that. And then second, what we want you to do is identify a mission field that you are consistently bringing the hope and the light and the glory of Christ to. Like there's dark places in our community. And we need to be going there. Maybe it's a neighborhood. Maybe it's a school. Maybe it's a classroom. Uh, maybe it's a sports team. Maybe it's, maybe it's your work. But you're bringing God's glory to whatever it is, wherever it is that God has actually called you to, to let his light shine. And the nice thing is, as I'm looking around even right now today, some of you guys, like, you're nailing this. And I didn't have to even like, challenge you on it. Like You understood who you are in Christ, and you've been living out that identity for, for years now. And I just want to highlight a few of you just to encourage you. And I know some of you, you hate stuff like this. You don't want me to talk about you. 
too bad. I'm on stage, you're not. So here's the deal. Uh, when I think of Brad, like, I think of somebody who's living this out really well. Uh, Brad has a consistent ministry here at our church. Um, he's on our security team. He makes sure that door gets open for you with a smile. Uh, he makes sure that everything's just set up just right, and he makes sure that all the heads are counted. And then he does a ton of maintenance and, and other things uh, around the church. But you know what? He's also got a mission field. And I don't even know all the mission fields that he has, but I love the conversations that I have with Brad when he comes in. He's like, hey, I was talking with a guy, and then he tells a story. I was like, who's the guy, right? It was just some dude who was like pumping gas next to him. Just some guy in tractor supply. It was just some woman he happened to see. Like he sees, he's constantly going into our community and he's seeing these are individuals who need the gospel in their life, the good news of Jesus, and he communicates it. And what's funny is every, almost every single time after I'm done having that conversation with him, I'm encouraged, but at the same time there's a conviction where I'm wondering, hmm, I wonder if I would have had that conversation. I wonder if I would have seen that individual the way Brad saw that individual and stepped in and had that gospel conversation, or if I would have just neglected it altogether. And then we've got individuals like Shannon. Shannon, who, uh, who serves with our children's uh, program. And I don't know if you've ever spent time with Shannon, but she's constantly seeing people's needs in our community. And when she sees that need, I mean, she mobilizes people around those folks. And whether it's getting someone to the hospital, whether it's providing food and eggs, like, to the entire church. <laughs> I mean, she's constantly, constantly reaching out. Uh, I think of people like Kelsey. Kelsey, who serves regularly and also has a mission field, uh, a heart for her friends. And she realizes that the youth ministry is a perfect place for her friends to actually engage uh, the good news of Jesus. And so she invites those friends. And, and there's Tony. And I know Tony's, like, probably cringing right now. He's like, ah, if I sat close enough, maybe he'd just look over my head. Sorry, Tony. Um, Tony is one of those guys that if anything happens in our church, like anything breaks, anything's funky in our church, like he's the guy that has to fix it. It's like, Tony, help us. And so that's his ministry uh, on a regular basis. And then there's children's ministry. And he does so many things. But if there's ever a need in our community, he's one of the first guys to, to drop everything and to try to meet that need, whether it's a maintenance issue, whether it's <laughs> I need your tractor to like plow <laughs> my, my garden or whatever it is, um, whether it's a pastor who just has a real hard time with a weed whacker, um, he'll take care of it, right? Like he has this mission field. I even think of my son Owen. Uh, he, he's usually behind the camera, uh, so if there's a mess up today with the camera, that's on Vernon, that's not on Owen. <laughs> Um, but he also, he also serves with our children's program. He also has a mission field, uh, which is his lacrosse team. Um, Owen has uh, a lacrosse team that, you know, some of the, the, the guys on that team do not know Christ. And so what he wants to do is he wants to re represent Christ well. And, uh, like, there was, there was an incident, like, a couple weeks ago where there was some, I don't even know what, how to describe it. Tempers had flared, I guess, and people were ejected. Let's just leave it at that. And, uh, and I remember going over there, and uh, one of the boys, one of the boys on his team is just, like, fired up, and, like, he's ripping his shirt off. He's like, ugh. And it was basically the equivalent of, all right, let's, like, fight these guys or something crazy. And he's like, Owen, are you with me? And Owen got this big smile on his face. He's like, no, man. Like, that was it. Like, no, I'm not with you. Why? Because he knows who he is in Christ, and he enters that team, and he says, I'm going to represent Christ here. Uh, to the point where the coach has even asked him to like lead prayers, uh, lead prayers after the uh, the game. You know, this is what it looks like. This is what it looks like to to be the church. Say, hey, we're going to be united around this mission of bringing Christ's light to the world, and we're going to do it here, united together. And in this unity that we have now, when we're done, what do we do? We go out there, and we bring people closer to Christ in the conversations we have, in the service that we give. This is what we're called to do. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to represent your son, Jesus. And I know as a church and as an individual, as a pastor, sometimes I look and I think, ah, we're not doing a very good job. And maybe we're covering ourselves up with cement because we're focused on our preferences. Because we've somehow lost the mission and, we've, and we make things more about ourselves and less about you. Father, I pray that you would do a work in our hearts that you would do a work in our hearts to the point where tomorrow morning, this afternoon, this evening, this week, this month, this year, that every single day we would wake up knowing who we are and knowing what we need to do. I pray this all in your son Jesus' name.